This building that you see once belonged to an Arab family named Alkaf. It was called Mount Washington by the family and stood on a hill at what is now called Tulukblanga Green. From it, you could see the sea and the islands to the south of Singapore. The house still stands today, and while its glory has faded somewhat, you can still imagine the gracious lifestyle of the people who lived here once. The al Kaf family is one of several prominent Arab families in Singapore and have been here since the 1860s. Now, who are the Arabs and how did they come to be in Singapore in the first place? Well, the Arabs come from the Middle East and are Muslims. In ancient times, they left their homes in Saudi Arabia and Hadramaut Valley in South Yemen to travel across the world. As their knowledge of shipping and sea power grew, they set sail south and east, sailing first to East Africa. Then they sailed on to India and eastwards in search of camphor, cinnamon, pepper, silk, gold, gems and porcelain. Later they ventured further and came to Southeast Asia with some going to Indonesia, some to the Malay Peninsula and others to Singapore. Some also went to the Philippines. The Arabs came to Singapore in the early 1800s and it is said that they were quite well established when Raffles arrived in 1819. You can see models of some early Arab settlers at the Pioneers of Singapore display at Sentosa. There are three main Arab families here, the Aljunids, who were the first to arrive, followed by the al Sagofs, then the al Kafs. But even up till today, the Arab community is very small, numbering between 1,000 and 2,000. It's hard to arrive at an exact number because many Arabs have married people of other races. Most of the Arabs who travelled east were traders, bringing carpets, jewels, textiles and other sorts of goods. Some did not come straight from the Middle East, but from India, bringing cotton goods with them, which they sold to people here. And that was the beginning of many businesses dealing with the import and export of textiles. The Aljunid family, for instance, were mainly textile traders, and to this day are still well known for their batik. Other Arabs worked in areas such as printing, and the al Sagof family was very influential in Malay newspaper circles before the Second World War. Said Hussein bin Ali al Sagof founded a Malay daily with Datuk On bin Jaffa in January 1930, called the Warta Malaya. And he was also the printer, publisher and manager of the then well-known weekly Malay pictorials, Warta Ahad and Warta Janaka. What was life like for the early Arab settler? Well, for one thing, when they came to Singapore, they didn't settle down in any one place, although you might have thought that they lived around Arab Street. This area did have some Arabs, but the roads around here were actually just named after places in the Middle East. However, if you go down to Bussara Street, you can see terrace houses 
that are a good example of the sort of house the early Arab settler lived in. Many of them were poor and couldn't afford to live in anything fancier. They also didn't need much room, as most had left their families back in South Yemen or Saudi Arabia. After a time, the Arabs who came found wives among the local women, mainly Malays. This helped them to settle down and put down roots in Singapore. But they kept their ties with their homeland too. They sent money back, and when they had children, they often sent them back to the Middle East for their education, to Hadramaut, or to places like Cairo in Egypt and Beirut in Lebanon. In this way, their children also learnt about their culture and their Arab traditions. Some families didn't send their children back, but instead had them taught at home, where they had religious studies in Arabic. They also learnt a little arithmetic and geography. The Quran, the holy book of the Muslims, is written in Arabic, and Muslims all over the world learn to read it in Arabic, no matter what their own language is. The Arab community in Singapore kept up the traditions of life in the Middle East. For example, men and women were not allowed to mix freely, and women did not go out to work, but kept very much to the house. In this photograph, you can see that the people at this party are men. The women folk, by contrast, were very private. Our woman folks were, was not, um, does not mix very freely, they didn't even get out of the house. But since the Japanese occupation, they were forced to go out because the Japanese want to see them, you know, otherwise they get into trouble. There was definitely a distinction, female area, male area. Only kids can go to the, of course, kids we can go into either side, you know, but the grown-up, they don't, unless they are in the family. From several accounts, life in the early days was simple and no one had much spare time for pastimes. When they did have time, however, they would often have religious discussions and occasionally would play parlour games like draughts or chess. As time passed, though, games like tennis became very popular. They also listened to Arab music, which could be heard on the radio before the war. For a long time, you could recognise an Arab by the long flowing robes on the traditional headdress he wore. After the war though, and as the later generations grew up, many Arabs, who are an important part of local Muslim society, also began to wear Malay dress, for example, the baju or the sunko. They also adopted Western dress. So nowadays, it is difficult to tell an Arab, except by their family names, or the Said or Sharifa in front of their names. In countries like the Philippines and Indonesia, they have become so well absorbed that they have adopted local names as well. As time passed, the Arabs became wealthy enough to buy land, and they began to build houses and start plantations. And as their investments grew, certain areas in the island became identified with particular families. For example, the Alsagoths settled in Kampong Glam, Geylang, and Nasim Road. The Aljunids, who were among the biggest landowners in 19th century Singapore, owned the land at Fort Canning, which has since been acquired by the government. The Alkafs, on the other hand, owned a big portion of the land, which is now Senate Estate, and had a famous garden there called the Alkaf Gardens. This had a lake and many trees, and even a camel to entertain visitors. The arcade, a well-known building in the old days, was also built by the Alcafs and overlooked Collier Quay. The arcade was built by the Alcaf uh, around, around the turn of the century, and it was completed like, 1988, 19, 1901, or 19, or cannot be, 1908, I think, 1908, 1909, when it was completed. And they had their office up there themselves, and in 1937, they have it 
refurbished the office and it turned to that like that. When it was built, you know, I mean, they, they could not get tenants for the ground floor. You see that it is just before it was pulled out, it was used as shops and all that, you know. They had, they had not thought of a shop. They were thinking of, of letting it out as offices. In fact, few of them were empty in the ground floor. Was not, they couldn't find tenants. What they did was, they, they, at that time, they were not using cars. They were using horse carriage. So they used to put, put their horse carriage down below there. Several other local landmarks were also built by the Arabs, or on their land. Raffles Hotel was originally owned by the Alsagovs before they sold it. Another well-known building was the Britannia Club, opposite the Raffles Hotel. It is now the Singapore Armed Forces Non-Commissioned Officers Club building. Their success in commerce and industry soon made the Arab migrants leaders in society, and they became involved in many aspects of the local Muslim world. Up till the war, they dominated travel from this region to Mecca, which is the holy city of all Muslims. And Arabs often did much of the organizing and administration involved in taking pilgrims to visit Mecca. They were close friends of the Malay royalty and were even known to be involved in settling differences between Malay rulers. The Arabs soon became religious leaders too and built religious schools or madrasas. Syed Abdul Rahman bin Junid al Junid started the Madrasa al Junid al Islamia in 1927. Another madrasa, the Al Sagof Arab School, was founded by the late Syed Muhammad bin Ahmad Al Sagof. It opened in 1912 and still functions today. Syed Muhammad had very close ties with the British colonial rulers, and some Arabs, in fact, went to university in England in the 20th century. It was only natural then that Syed Muhammad insisted that English also be taught in the Al Sagof Arab School. Today, the children are still taught English. He felt ashamed, right? That was the answer given by Zunaina. Can I have another answer? Some other feelings that he uh, had, that was in his mind. These classes are mixed with classes in Arabic as well. Unfortunately, Syed Muhammad died in 1906, before the school was ready. But with foresight, he had also started the Muslim in Trust Fund, which manages the school, and left money and land to build the school. The schools are still active and have produced many members of the Muslim elite in both the religious and secular worlds. Arabs have also played a part as leaders of the Muslim faith. Several muftis in both Singapore and Peninsular Malaysia have been Arab. A mufti is the highest authority in the Muslim religious council in a country. The current mufti in Singapore is in fact Arab, Syed Isa bin Mohammed bin Samayed. And of course, the Arabs dedicated time and money to building mosques. One example is the Masjid Ba'alwi in Lewis Road, which was founded in 1952 by the late Syed Muhammad bin Salim al Atas. He left South Yemen for India and went to Indonesia and the Malay Peninsula before coming here. Syed Muhammad al Atas came from a long line of Imams. Imams lead the prayers in the mosque. Said Muhammad's son, Said Hassan, has followed in his father's footsteps, being the current Imam of the mosque. The mosque calls approximately 1,000 people to prayer on Fridays and has as many at its Thursday evening prayer meetings. As you can see, while the Arabs came from halfway across the world, they've not only become part of society here, they've also made significant contributions. Take this house, for instance, the Alkaf House. The government acquired it in 1960. But rather than destroy it to make way for new developments, the Singapore Tourist Promotion Board is going to restore it. This way, 
everyone will be able to enjoy it in its old splendor. Said Alwi bin Muhammad Al-Kaf, who is descended from the first Al-Kaf settler here, told us about the past. There, was, there used to be a very old house on it. And this dot place used to be called uh, Kampung Jago or Bukit Jago. There used to be an old house on it. And the Al-Kaf have bought it, bought that place. And it consists of land of about 47 acres with the land on the top, or with the old house on the top. Then they built the house. They then called that house they built Mount Washington. I believe it's been in, 19, in 1858 when the first Alcaf came to Singapore, but they, he did not come directly from South Yemen or what is known then as Hadramaut. I believe he came from Hadramaut to India, I mean from India to Surabaya, Indonesia. They were doing uh, spice trading between Indonesia, India and eventually to Europe. It's at about that time that I think the opening of Singapore was in full swing. That's when they, he came here. The first Al-Kaf was Said Sheikh bin Abdurrahman Al-Kaf. There were two of them that doing the, that was doing the business then, Said Sheikh and his brother Muhammad. But Muhammad did not leave any children, only Sheikh. So Sheikh brought his brother's children, Abdullah's children, and few of them settled down here. I came from the Sheikh family. Um, Sheikh got a son by the name of Ahmad. Ahmad is called Muhammad, that's my father, and then Alwi. So my name is Alwi bin Muhammad bin Ahmad bin Sheikh. Be before the war, of course, we, we, we kept quite a lot of our Arabic traditions uh, before, till, till, af till about war time, you know, the, I mean, first, second world war. But after that, there's a lot of changes. I think there's a lot of changes that, that took place during the occupation, Japanese occupation. This is the way my grandfather, for example, even my father was using this sort of dress until around about 1930s or so. This is his dress then. But after the Japanese occupation, even the hat was dropped off completely. The older folks, when I mean the older folks, like my father, he and my friend's father would probably be speaking Arabic. But I, when his son, would probably be speaking Malay. It's about my time when the language is, 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 as I said, because there was a lot of intermarriage with the Malays and what, so we follow our mother. So we speak, uh, and um, <clears throat> it's quite naturally that uh, we follow because we speak more to our mother than our father, you know. Father was ordained, office, you know, whatever they were doing. Normally, they, they send, if they have, say, four children, they probably would send one out to Arabia to have them taught in their religion and the language. So you find in a family, one or two could speak Arabic and the rest could not. In my, it's the same with my case, you know. I speak very, very little Arabic. That is not by learning, you know, just by mixing. Uh, with those who come from, who come to visit us from Arabia, by mixing with them and then lately with the trade and what you, so I pick up the Arabic. But uh, <clears throat> the real one who we send there, send there, they are they are good in the Arabic. They, they, they do their, they, they speak the Arabic well. They can write Arabic, you know, the whole lot. But um, the the rest of the children are just studying here, starting from right from primary school. It goes the same with the Al Sagar family, Al Junet family, the whole lot, you know. Most of them are like that now. Although we were in English school, in the evenings we still attend what we call religious uh, class. Not so much Arabic, but some of them even learn Arabic, yes. But the, the, the emphasis there in on religion, because the school do not teach religion and therefore we were given home tuition to study uh, Arabic, I mean, uh, religion. Arranged marriages. 
Obviously so, yes. They will eventually be told, we are going to marry you off to so-and-so. If they make too much noise, uh, the parent would probably think again. They, they, the girl particularly may, may, may not like it. For I don't know why, because she don't know who he, who, how he looks like. But for any reason whatsoever, she might be crying. And that signifies no. The religion says so. Um, if you don't answer, you are silent, that you accept it. But if you cried out, you know, say something, then, then the parent will think again, you know, probably propose another name or something like that. Although those times are long past, this house will remain as a monument to the Arabs of Singapore. When it's complete, you can come and have a look at it and remember a community that, though small, has played their special role in our history.